Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another great show for you tonight. We had such a great time last week at Harmon Park in Kearney, but we couldn't answer any of your phone calls. So tonight we're going to fire up those phone lines. You can give us a call, dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us a picture question via email, that address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us as much information as you can, including where you live. During the week, please be sure to check out our social media options. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So Wayne, no insect, or else it's hiding in your hand. Oh, it's there. <laughs> what do we have tonight? <laughs> well, no literary work this time. That's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, what I have here is I have roast chafer. Uh, it's been getting into my raspberries in my backyard. As the name implies, we're used to seeing it on roses, uh, but it does get into a number of other things, including uh, linden trees, roses, and raspberries. And you can see the skeletonizing damage here on the leaf. There's the little insect right there. It is a scarab beetle. It's one generation a year. Uh, my preferred method of control is the satisfying crunch between my thumb and forefinger. <laughs> However, if you are going to use any kind of chemical control, make sure you watch the pre-harvest interval, especially mm -hmm. if you're in close on harvest on some of your small fruits. I think we're going to have to go out and look at our patch in our garden because I wouldn't have thought of rose mm -hmm. chafers and oh, Jeff's we, blackberry patch. Oh, right. These raspberries sit right underneath my linden trees that have just started blooming, so they're there we probably go. a little more prone. All right. Thank you, Wayne. You're in the turf chair. Yeah. And? Well, I'm, I'm continuing my uh, series of ground covers and alternatives to uh, turf. <laughs> so tonight what I brought in is butter burr. And uh, it's gotten a little limp on me here in the heat after I picked it. But uh, what it is is it's, it's a nice ground cover. It uh, creates really large leaves. These are actually kind of small. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, early in the spring, it has this kind of odd alien-looking flower that pops out of the ground. And you're not sure really what it is. And then that's soon followed by these large leaves. And uh, so it kind of discontinues. I have it on the north side of my house, so it gets about half day sun. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those that you wouldn't want it in a real hot, sunny spot. You're gonna want it someplace where maybe it's out of the late day sun, you know, morning sun is fine. And you may, in, in uh, really warm weather, have to give it some supplemental water. So it's, it's not carefree, but uh, it does cover a large area pretty quickly. And makes it much easier to not mow. That's right, exactly. All right, thanks, Jeff. Okay, Sarah, we're getting a lot of questions about what you've got there. Yeah, so um, like Kim said, lots of questions about symptoms like this appearing on hostas. And other, other plants, too, can be affected by this. So it, it could be really easy to look at this and say, okay, we've got leaf spots here. We've got a dead lesion of leaf in the center, so this must be a disease. Well, actually, no. This is, this is completely environmental. So uh, we've got, these are some hosta that are in too much sun. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not getting enough water, and so we're getting some scorch, some burning of the leaves, whether it's in the middle of the leaf or whether it's along the edges of the leaf, um, but this is all environmental. So, you know, you could, you could potentially trim off a few of these leaves that are most badly affected and then just start watering, give your plants a little bit more water, and as new foliage comes out, you know, it'll, it'll hopefully stay uh, nice, nice and green and looking normal. Um, but you definitely don't want to use any kinds of insecticides or herbic or uh, fungicides because this is an environmental issue, not a disease. So again, it just kind of goes back to the point that it's really important to diagnose and know exactly what you're dealing with before you start applying chemicals. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. All right, what do we have, Kelly? Okay, well, I brought um, a sedum known as Angelina sedum. And it's one of my favorite ones. Actually, one of my master gardeners said it was one of her favorites, and I always listen to my master gardeners, so I bought some and planted it too. And like, like most of our sedum, it, uh, these are called stone crops, and the reason they're called stone crops is because in their native environment, they often grow on stony ledges. So they like it hot and dry, full sun, and it seems like the more heat, the better. And this one is, it, it looks green in this picture, but actually out in the garden, it's, it's very yellow. And this year it's blooming quite well. You can see the blossom there. 
and that act stands up probably almost six inches above the plant. And it, it typically doesn't bloom this well, so I don't know if it's just loving the heat or, um, or what, or just no freezes early in the spring, but it's blooming quite well. But if you're looking for something um, for a hot, dry, even gravelly, rocky, uh, any of the stone crops, but this Angelina one is, is a nice one to mix in with different colored sedums. You can kind of create a mosaic if you mix many different uh, colors and leaf shapes and so on, and Angelina is a nice one for yellow. Excellent, and, and that is a fun one. And I've never seen it bloom like that either. Ours yeah, in the backyard yeah. farmer garden is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mine's doing quite well. Hopefully that doesn't mean she's wanting to go belly up. Right, hopefully. <laughs> All right, first picture question is yours, Wayne. This is uh, a Lincoln viewer who has these in her strawberries. And she did say she did manage to harvest some before those little guys got them, but what are they and how can you avoid them in a strawberry patch, either this year or next? Well, they're gonna fly in, so there's nothing you can do to really prevent them. At this point... Um, what are they? Bugs. Spoiling the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> what you probably start out with is a few damaged fruits, mm -hmm. and damaged fruits like this are very attractive to sap beetles. All right and those sap beetles are there. They started on something that was probably slightly damaged and then they slowly work away at it until it, or overripe, and then they work away at it like that. Uh, if you're wanting to get rid of what's there because you've already attracted a bunch, harvest everything you want out of there, make sure you don't have any blooms, and then hit it with a permethrin type product, something that's gonna have a very short pre-harvest interval. Some of those have one to three day pre-harvest intervals so that you can get some more of your strawberries later. All right, and no way you can keep them out next year. Other than? Netting. Very fine netting, which would keep your pollinators out. Which In other words, bad. there's nothing you can do. All right, <laughs> buy them at the grocery store. Okay, so Jeff, you have actually a couple pictures back to back. Okay. Um, this is Bridgeport, a new turf issue. Looks to be dry spots, but the spots get bigger and then they spread to other parts of the yard. Neighboring yard is showing the same thing. Does have water, they have treated for grubs. So okay. that's the Bridgeport one. And then the second one is North Platte and trying to show some browning at the base of the plants, not at all the lawn. They don't think it's lack of moisture again. Okay. So any ideas on any of either of these? Well, fortunately, I have really smart panelists with me tonight, so <laughs> they, can, they help me out. Uh, my uh, sun-baked brain wasn't helping me too much, so. Um, uh, the first one, uh, Sarah was suggesting maybe Ascochyta leaf blight. Mm -hmm. um, so, which is something that after kind of coolish weather followed by hot weather, you may get this sudden uh, browning or bleaching of the, of the leaves. Uh, so again, as Sarah was telling me before the show, look and make sure that there's still some green at the base. And if it is, kind of good cultural practices, make sure you're watering it, not overwatering. Mm -hmm. um, and just keep an eye on it and it should come out of it. Okay. And I think with the other one, the same thing. I mean, I, I think right at this time of year, you know, we need to look at raising our mower decks. They should be at least three inches high. Uh, make sure that you're watering, but not frequently. Mm -hmm. And you're watering at the right time of the day, not in the afternoon, not in the evening, you know, waiting till morning or uh, very early afternoon so that things dry out overnight. All right, good, thanks, Jeff. And we have had a lot of questions about Ascochyta mm -hmm. this season. All right, Sarah, you have a couple of different um, oak pictures. The first is Prague, or Prague, Nebraska. Leaves are curled and small. All the trees around, oaks, maple, etc., seem fine. And the second is essentially the same thing. Uh, red oak, this one, um, it's on the kind of the crest of a small bank. So are, are we seeing the same thing here? I know, Jeff, we have a couple oaks on campus that have done the same mm -hmm. thing. What do we think this is? Well, so the first two things that come to mind for, this, for me on this is either herbicide drift or it could be physiological leaf roll. So if it's herbicide drift, you know, there's, and I don't know where in town, well, they're in, they're in Prague, so they're in the, mm -hmm. in the farm fields, in the countryside. So a lot of farmers are spraying right now, weed control in the fields. You could be getting drift of a 2,4-D or a dicamba or something like that, which could certainly cause the leaves to curl. But I would expect to see other plants in the landscape affected too. So possibly plants in the vegetable garden or tomatoes or, or uh, nearby uh, trees could also be showing some kinds of symptoms if it's herbicide drift. So if just one single tree in the landscape and nothing else is affected, 
then it could be a physiological leaf roll. So we do see some trees do this, especially when conditions start to get hot and dry, and they, they will curl the leaves, and it's a mechanism for the tree to try to reduce water loss uh, and, and hold on to the water that the tree has. Um, usually with physiological leaf roll, you don't really see the trees grow out of it. They usually mm -hmm. stay that way all season long. If it's herbicide drift, after the herbicide incident happens, when the new growth comes on the tree later in the season, those leaves tend to be normal. They tend to come out and have the normal shape that an oak leaf should have, and they tend to be flat and not curled. So hopefully that gives you a few ideas of a couple options of what might be going on. If it is physiological leaf roll, then maybe just some good deep waterings of this tree would help the tree to just be more vigorous and, and maybe avoid, um, avoid this in the future. All right, thanks, Sarah. All right, Kelly, um, this is actually just south of campus here. Mm -hmm. She's wondering what this plant is and what she can do about the fact that it is suckering all over the base <laughs> and all over the yard. And she's saying at least 20 feet away from the base of the tree. So um, she, she's wondering what we can tell her about okay. this. Well, this is a, a Canada red cherry, <coughs> actually a choke cherry. It's a red leafed form of a choke cherry. And it's a tree form that would give anything in the world to be a shrub. <laughs> and so it naturally suckers at the base as well as up throughout the yard. And there really is no way to stop it. I mean, in the yard, you can keep mowing them off and that will control them. The ones at the base on a very regular basis before they get too large, you should be pruning them off, ideally right below ground level, um, but they will return. And there are some products on the market. Um, I've heard that maybe will slow them down a little bit, but it will not stop those suckers. This is just a tree that's natural for it. Uh, it wants to be a shrub. So if, you know, Canada red cherry, uh, Schubert is, you know, mm -hmm. there's some belief that they're actually the same plant or one is a sport, branch sport of the other. But if, if you plant either one of those, you're going to have this issue. So if you really want a purple leaf tree in the landscape, maybe look at something like a purple leaf smoke tree would be another suggestion. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, one of the eternal questions we get about mowing your turf is whether to bag those clippings or mulch them. For our first feature tonight, Extension Assistant Scott Evans tells us mulching is always best, but you can make use of those clippings if you bag them. Today we're going to talk about how you can reuse your grass clippings instead of throwing them away in the landfill. The first thing that you can actually do is use your mower and mulch those grass clippings back into the lawn. Most mowers now come equipped with a mulching blade, but check the instructions that came with your machine just to make sure and to see if there's any small adjustments that might, be, might need to be made. One of the biggest questions that we get about returning your grass clippings to the lawn is does it contribute to thatch buildup? And no, it does not. Thatch is primarily made up of the underground stems and root system of the turf grass and not the leaf blades. A lot of the research is showing that the leaf blade can actually be up to about 90% water. Some of the benefits of returning the turf um, the grass clippings back to the lawn is nutrient recycling and improving the organic content of the soil. Some of the research suggests that by returning the grass clippings over the course of a growing season, you can return up to a pound of nitrogen to the soil throughout the course of the growing season. The grass clippings will also help improve the organic content of the soil, which will help improve the water uptake of the soil. The second thing that you can do with your grass clippings is to bag it and use it as mulch around your plants. We caution people not to use any of the grass clippings that may have been sprayed with a post-emergent um, weed killer such as 2,4-D, dicamba, or quinchloric. When you're using any mulch product around your plants, you want to make sure that you don't place too much mulch around the crown of the plant. When using grass clippings, you want to put down maybe a half inch to an inch of the grass clippings down at one time. Any more that you put down, you can actually start building up some foul smell, which is not exactly what we're looking for. So it's really easy to do, and you're continuing that nutrient recycling part of the grass clippings. 
The third thing that you can do with your grass clippings is make a compost pile with them. It's really simple to do, but you want to make sure that you don't overdo it. With the grass clippings, they can either be a green or a brown. If you're going to use them as a brown, you're going to need to spread them out, allow them to dry out for a couple of days before you add them to your compost pile. If you're using them as a green, go ahead and add them right away and just mix them in with your existing compost pile. All right, so wrapping this up, what you're gonna do is you can actually return those clippings to the lawn. You're gonna improve the soil fertility and the water uptake of the lawn. If you're gonna bag it, go ahead and use those around those plants, such as your fruits and vegetables. It makes an excellent mulch. Or you can use your grass clippings as a compost in your compost pile. Most of the time we're going to recommend mulching those clippings right back into the lawn, but as Scott said, they can be used in a number of ways around the garden and the compost bin. I always mulch mine and then I always wish I would have bagged them <laughs> about this time of year. All right, next pictures, Wayne, are yours. Uh, these are IDs, bang, 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 because it is, what is this insect time? Sure. Uh, First one is from Bellevue. What are these insects on the grape leaf? And are they good guys or bad guys? Hard to tell exactly um, with the small little red things. They're probably assassin bugs. Oh. Uh -huh. I know, and it's, it's yeah. kill at night tonight, I guess, in the insect <laughs> chair. Do they do any damage? No, they're beneficial. As the name implies, they eat other things. Okay, all right. I assume not assassinating yeah. plants. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, so the second one is Omaha, and these little tiny ones were all over his columbine. Yeah. They don't seem to be hurting the plant. Yeah, it's really hard to tell because there's a light sheen right behind the head on this one. It could be one of two different stink bugs. It could be the twice stabbed or the two spotted stink bug. The twice stabbed is a plant feeding semi-pest, mm -hmm. whereas the two spotted is beneficial and predatory. So you look right behind the head there and there'll be two black spots in the orange band and that's the two spotted. So the, he might want to harvest those and take them into extension, maybe, okay. And the third one is she found this on some packing paper in a recycle bin and she's got a scale there and that's a two, yep. two inch long critter. That is a stonefly. Uh, it's one of the giant stonefly group and they're beneficial. The adults do a little more than drink water. Okay, even though they're big enough to eat a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we actually have two people that sent us pictures of this same weed, Jeff. Okay. Uh, from two different parts of the state, and of course we see it all over here too. Uh, the one person did say it was already about four or five feet tall. So what oh, is good it? for them. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it now that we control it? <laughs> uh, it's curly dock, mm -hmm. and so it's a perennial, and it's a member you can with the seed, and you see these with a lot of our weedy plants. It's a member of the buckwheat family, so it produces a um, a lot of seed, and the seed, like a lot of our weeds last, you know, they, they throw these 80 years or something like that. <laughs> so anyway, so once you get it, it's hard to get rid of. So I would say um, a couple of things. First of all, with the seed heads, it's important that you get rid of those, bag them, put them in the garbage. Uh, you don't want that spreading at all. And then, you know, it's very tough to control. Really the fall with a three-way herbicide would probably be the best way to deal with it unless you're you know, excited about it and you want to go out with a spade and try to dig it up. But they have a tap root and it's something that may kind of return. So I would say maybe try for the digging and then plan on doing some spraying in the fall. Okay, and when you see it for sale at farmer's market in the fall, oh. don't buy it. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Sarah, you have a couple too. This is kind of leaf spot time in mm -hmm. pathology. The first is actually uh, on Rudbeckia. Mm -hmm and she's wondering what and what to do about it. And the second is three-year-old hibiscus from Seward, random leaves kind of turning purple, and she's showing the, the full plant here, and, mm -hmm. and then the kind of the close-up is, is the randomness. Well, the rudbeckia uh, is certainly a leaf spot. There's a couple of different leaf spots that affect the rudbeckia. There's septoria, then there's one called angular leaf spot. So uh, septoria is fungal, angular leaf spot is bacterial, but, um, you know, unless it's really affecting the plants, I'm not sure that I would really do any type of control. I mean, what you can see sometimes is maybe some uh, leaf death at the base of the plants, you know, kind of moving up the plant if it's a really severe infection. Um, 
so if you think it's severe enough to warrant control, the only, the only option you really have then is going to be to apply a protective fungicide and protect the new growth from becoming infected. So you would use a, like a copper fungicide, a liquid copper that you might be able to get at the garden store or something with chlorothalonil in it or something along that line and just spray the foliage, make sure you get good coverage and, and try to slow the disease down that way. Um, the symptoms on the hibiscus, I'm a little unsure of. It, it doesn't look like a classic disease to me. So I'm wondering if maybe it's, it could be something environmental uh, along the lines of the leaf scorch that we were looking at earlier on, or maybe some kind of physical damage. Um, so I guess I would just keep a close eye on that this summer. You could go ahead and take off the affected leaves, just kind of pinch them off and see how the plant performs if, if this condition spreads or if the plant does fine without those leaves. Um, my, I'm, I'm leaning a little bit more toward abiotic rather than a true disease. All right, thank you, Sarah. And I think we had Rebecca on campus that mm -hmm. we finally gave up on, didn't mm -hmm. we, with yeah. the leaf spot? Right. All right, thanks. Okay, Kelly, uh, this is a Holt County viewer. Maple planted two years ago, staked the first two seasons, took the stakes off, and here came the wind. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they're leaning. She wants to know if they pull it back up and stake it. Do they do anything with the soil? Mm -hmm. What are we going to recommend? It, it's a small enough tree that it would be feasible to pull it back up and restake it. Um, don't do anything to the, I wouldn't do anything to the soil, especially do not add soil over the top. Um, because as little as one to two inches can really stress a tree and even kill a tree. Now, you would restake it, and um, at one to two years, it's still loose, still kind of leaning, and then I would remove the tree. Uh, a concern here is that, you know, has the tree been predisposed to, for some reason, to wind throw or leaning? Um, maybe that root system is not developing, and it could be, it, it's hard to tell because it has that white con on it and it has a, mm -hmm. a mat at the base, so I really couldn't see the trunk going into the ground. But if, take off that white, that shouldn't be on there in the summer anyway, by the way. Um, we want, it was a type of maple, I, I couldn't right. tell, it might be an autumn blaze maple, I really couldn't tell from the picture. Um, but you want to protect that trunk only during the winter with wrap or a, that white wrap like you have, but make sure you take it off in the summer. So take that off, and if it looks like, uh, you know, if you can see the taper at the base of that tr taper, then it probably wasn't planted too deep. Um, but if it kind of goes into the ground straight, there's no taper, maybe it was planted too deep, and that's going to predispose that tree um, now and maybe even for the rest of its life to wind throw, wind toss. And the other thing that can happen is if it was in a plastic container and the roots were growing in a circle and they were not you know, pulled out when you planted it, then maybe those roots have just continued to grow in that circle and they're not growing outward and anchoring the tree like they're meant to. So you, know, you can put it up, but there might be other issues there underground. Um, and as the tree gets taller, then it gets uh, riskier. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, because of all the heat we've been having, our garden is exploding with color. There are also a lot of other things that are coming into their own, including some of our vegetables. Let's take a minute to see what's happening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're watching the end of our peas because it's getting pretty hot. You can see the beautiful blue flowers of the borage, which tastes a little bit like cucumber with a lot of fuzz. Our Twizzle Purple Penstemon, which is an All-America perennial selection, is absolutely fabulous. We have cabbage loopers after our cabbage, as do probably a lot of other people across the state. Our Swiss chard has grown to be monstrous big and quite beautiful. And our Artworks Broccoli has actually headed out you can see that it is also starting to send out its side shoots, which is one of the reasons it was bred, so that rather than having only one giant head of broccoli early in the season and then nothing, what you end up doing is being able to, to harvest those little tiny side shoots. We also have absolute gorgeousness going on because it's been so hot, our irrigation system is working, and our annual flowers are looking just beautiful. That's what's happening this week in the Backyard Farmer Garden. Seems like just a few weeks ago we were wondering if spring was ever going to get here and now it's been so hot. I guess we have to be careful what we're wishing for. I am glad I don't have tickets to the College World <laughs> Series. <laughs> so, but if you're in Lincoln, please be our guest and do take a tour of the Backyard Farmer Garden. We are open 365, 24 hours a day. All right, so questions next. Wayne, 
Um, this is a viewer in Bellevue who for the past few years has had trouble with spider mites consuming tomato plants. Any prevention this time of year? Well, with our hot weather, it's probably a good thing to be watching out for. Uh, mm -hmm. Spider mites on a wide variety of plants. Uh, one of the things that I like to recommend with spider mites is if you start to see any kind of damage showing up using your hose. Um, use it in the morning when it has a chance to dry off during the rest of the day so you're not like we do with our turf and everything else, you know, we don't want it that to stay wet very long. But those, it will reduce the population of spider mites. Otherwise, if you're gonna come back with a chemical insecticide to treat for those spider mites, you're gonna wanna make sure you don't have any blooms on there because you will adversely affect your pollinators when they do that. Because you're gonna have to use a bifenthrin or a malathion in order to control spider mites. All right, thank you, Wayne. Jeff, this is a Grand Island viewer who wants to know how you know whether your drop spreader for seeding or fertilizing is functioning correctly. She sets it the way she thinks it is, but right. she has a lot left in the, in the box. Well, um, what we'll do is we'll calibrate the spreader. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea, if you have a rough setting based on the product or the seed, it may have, it may have a setting for your particular spreader. Uh, we'll mark out an area, even on your driveway, uh, so you have a certain amount of uh, square feet, whether it's 100 square feet or 1,000 square feet. You put the amount of product that you want to use in that area. You spread it out and see how it goes, and then you adjust accordingly. And, and again, if it's something like on your driveway or in your garage, you can sweep it up and reuse it. So, All right. So that's kind of a simple, basic way to calibrate something that is, uh, you're kind of unsure what you're doing. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Sarah, this is a houseplant question. Uh, Hoya. And um, the viewer is saying they have dark spots on the underside of the leaves and white blotches on the top, but it's flowering all right. Any ideas on Hoya? Hmm. Well, um, Hoya can get some fungal leaf spot diseases too. Um, and then they can be prone, I mean, um, they like moderate indoor temperatures. So if it's sitting too close to a window in the winter time and the window is cold, you might actually be getting some little burn patches on the leaves. So, I mean, that's a possibility too. So. Um, Depending on how many leaves are affected, what I might do is just remove those leaves and see if it spreads or if, it, if the leaves continue to be infected or if that stops it. Um, and I think that might be enough to just control it. Usually, the, usually Hoyas are not uh, susceptible to a lot of really serious leaf spot diseases. They're usually minor issues. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Kelly, this is a Springfield viewer who has um, tomatoes, healthy plants, lots of flowers, no fruit setting on. Okay, well, it could just be our heat, most yeah. likely. Tomatoes will not set fruit um, if temperatures, especially nighttime temperatures, are very, very warm. And we have had some very warm nighttime temperatures, so be patient, and I bet they will start to set fruit, if unless it stays very hot. Are you ready? I'm Kelly. ready. We have a Lee, Nebraska viewer who removed a bunch of junipers and wants to know how long before they can replant something in the same spot. Um, go ahead and plant. Perfect. It's too hot now, but go ahead and plant. <laughs> okay, uh, the perennial corn suckers or tillers, should they be removed or left? Yeah, you can leave them on. There's no benefit to prove, research has not shown any real benefit to removing those. All right, a Skylar viewer says his cherry has very small leaves this year and very few fruits. What's going on with that? It's in decline, possibly. It's stressed. It might have been some winter injury, especially if it was a sweet, sweet cherry. So um, take good care of it and hope for the best. All right, we have a viewer who has a hearts of gold red bud in Lincoln and the leaves are cupped and curled, is that normal? No, and red bud is very sensitive to herbicide injury, so I would suspect it's herbicide injury. The new growth should be normal if that's what it is. All right, what would cause a peach iris to bloom white, just one in the whole bunch? Oh, reverting back. I mean, if it was a hybrid, um, sometimes they revert back. Um, I guess we could blame the weather, too, if we want to. We blame it on everything else. Perfect. Nice job, Kelly. Okay, Sarah, in the path chair. All right, we'll give it a whirl. <laughs> we, have a, we have a York viewer who says he has spots on his cucumber leaves, south-facing. Okay, so there's lots of cucumber leaf spot diseases that are starting now. And um, if it is a leaf spot disease, you're going to need to start with some fungicides to protect the new growth. All right. Is there a disease that kills eastern red cedar that you're aware of? No, not, not really. There are some fungal diseases, but they're not fatal. Okay. 
We have a viewer who says the daylilies are streaking and spotting the foliage. Is this a disease likely or heat? There is a daylily leaf spot, <clears throat> a leaf streak, but I'm thinking really more heat, more likely than a fungal problem. Okay, we have a black jelly-like fungus that is on the branches, the dead branches of oaks. Is that something to worry about? Um, it, it could be uh, like a bacterial, um, I'm trying to think, can't think of the name. Um, bacterial wet wood, something along that line, or it could be gummosis, some, some sap leaking or something like that. Um, unfortunately, there's not gonna be a whole lot you're gonna be able to do unless you prune out an entire branch. Okay, yeah, good, nice job. Jelly-like, that was a weird <laughs> sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's good. All right, what kind yeah. of jelly? I don't want a question like that, okay. <laughs> oh, yours, are really, pass. yours pass. are really hard questions. <laughs> Okay, this viewer uh, wonders when the nut sedge treatment window is for sedge hammer. Uh, you know, we're, it's getting ready to close here, so the longest day of the year, and then we switch over to dismiss. Okay. Uh, a viewer says they have a new lawn with a lot of, of crabgrass. Can they spray for it now, or should they? You know, with the heat, I, I don't know if I'd spray any herbicides right now, quite honestly. So I think keep it mowed at the right height. Don't let it put on seed. Uh, if it really bothers you, go out and pull it. Okay, we have a Hornick, Iowa viewer who used Tenacity and then is wondering how long they should wait for a weed and feed application. Well, I wouldn't do any weed, weed and feed application until later this fall, so, or till after the middle of August anyway, so you've got several weeks. Okay, when do you control Creeping Charlie? Uh, you know, I would do it in the fall, again. Another thing with using something like Confront or Drive, I like to combine those two. So that seems to be a magic formula for me. Okay, is the honey vine milkweed early this year? I didn't think it ever stopped growing. So <laughs> uh, it seems like it's early this year. So I pulled a bushel basket of it, basket of it yesterday. So yeah, okay. it's everywhere. I think you're right on that. Yeah. It's like, what happened there? Yeah. <clears throat> you ready, Wayne? I suppose. <laughs> Such enthusiasm. All right, so what is eating the cabbage leaves right now, and can it be treated without using chemicals? Could be cabbage looper, or it could be the um, white, uh, cabbage white, either one. If you're gonna treat it, treat it with either a, you can do a BT, like a Dipel, a Carbaryl, or a permethrin. All right, single eggs on little tiny thread-like stalks. Green lacewing eggs, good guys, leave them alone. All right. Uh, leaves are curling and discoloring in garden flocks. Could be flocks plant bug. And Another permethrin type product on those, don't use carbaryl. Perfect. So seeing damage to hostas that is not Sarah's environmental thing, but it isn't slugs, what kind of beasties? It's a little early for blister beetles, but they will also chomp on those crushed seashells or another carbaryl or permethrin type product would take care of those. All right, a uh, viewer says that these little insects look like ants and then they get wings. What are they? Little insects that look like ants that have wings. Could be the reproductive forms that okay. they're seeing. All right, excellent, nice job all. Who won? I think we tied. <laughs> Three-way tie. <laughs> all right, Kelly, plant of the week comes to you next. Oh, are you ready for it? Yep. <laughs> okay, well, this is, um, the purple one is lead plant. That's one of our native. It's actually kind of more of a woody shrub. And I think if I pull out here, you can see the leaves are kind of a gray, fuzzy leaf, which is, I think is just as pretty as the blossom itself. And whenever you have kind of a gray leaf, you know that's a very drought tolerant plant as a general rule of thumb. And these can get fairly um, fairly large, um, not huge, I'd say three feet by three feet, maybe that's stretching it. Um, but they, you can tell, see the blooms, the lavender blooms with the uh, orange um, stamens in there, make it very ornamental. And this is just a tough one. It is, as a native, it's, it's known, it's a very deep rooted, I think a common name of pioneers was devil shoestring. Mm -hmm. When they were trying to plow and just devil shoestring, I guess it speaks for itself. And then, let's go the right way, the white one is a New Jersey tea. And I believe this is a really good pollinator plant mm -hmm. as well. Um, I'm not as familiar with these. Uh, we planted a few of them last year in one of our water-wise landscapes. Um, but it's a, it's a small shrub as well, uh, maybe, uh, again, maybe three feet by three feet. 
and uh, sometimes you'll have some dieback in it. You might have to prune at the end of the winter. In spring, you'll have to prune out some dead branches every now and then. Uh, but it's another nice uh, uh, shrub, uh, and again, a good pollinator plant. So New, New Jersey tea and lead plant. Thanks, Kelly, and those are both actually out of our backyard farmer garden. Mm -hmm. So oh, great. you can see them in bloom. Mm -hmm. All right, Wayne, we have pictures for you again. Um, the first, this is a uh, La Vista viewer and said he has this bee colony or he thinks it's bees that was here last year and it's here this year. He wonders, are they good guys or bad guys? Yellow jackets, something else or something else? Well, I'm seeing multiple holes in that shot of mm -hmm. the area and it's also very sparse with the vegetation, so it's a nice open area for them to dig in. Most likely it's just a colony of solitary bees. Uh, while they may not help each other out, they do tend to nest together in the same areas when the conditions are right. And from this picture that's up now, it's really hard to tell at that size whether that's one of our smaller wasps or if that solitary wasp or if it's gonna be one of the bees. So if it's a solitary wasp, it means it's hunting other insects to feed to its larvae, so therefore it's beneficial, or it's one of our pollinators. So in other words, no spraying, no stomping. I would leave them alone. All right, and then your next one is uh, insects in his apple tree insect traps, and he's a master gardener in Rembrandt, Iowa. Okay, when I first saw this, my initial gut went, that looks like a carpenter worm. Hmm. When I look at that, the wing structure shape, general body shape, it reminds me of a carpenter worm but when you look at that penny next to it, it's rather small. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I'm not really sure what this particular one is, mm -hmm. but I would investigate carpenter worm because there are m more than one species out there and there could be a smaller one. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, this is an Elkhorn viewer. <laughs> <laughs> and he raises his eyebrows. <laughs> New brown spot in the right. middle of the yard, two by three across. It's RTF fescue. What what do we have going on here? You know, that looked like mycelium to me, so like the structure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, I guess I was thinking pythium maybe for mm -hmm. tall fescue. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd have that fishy odor. I mean, okay. they could, they could right. check for that fishy odor if that was the case. Mm -hmm. So again, I think, um, you know, you can treat that with of a turf fungicide. Um, so there's a variety of ones that would be able to treat that. I think I would look at cultural things first and mm -hmm. see if that would kind of help come out of it here, especially this time of year. So watch your water and make sure it's not staying wet mm -hmm. and, uh, and raise your deck a little bit and see if it'll grow out of it. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, this is a lilac question, and this is also Prague on an acreage. and. He He's saying several of the lilacs have leaves that are doing this. Uh, they haven't shown any previous signs of stress. What do you think? So I'm thinking this is also another herbicide issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there are herbicides that are used in crop fields that in, in, uh, um, inhibit pigment development in leaves. And so the symptoms can be where the leaves turn white or yellow like this. So I really think you've got some herbicide drift here. Hopefully the plants will grow out of it, you know, once the, the chemical is broken down and they put on some new growth. I don't think it will, probably won't kill them. So hopefully if it doesn't happen again, they'll recover and look normal next year. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sarah. Kelly, this is a lace bark elm question, which is an unusual and beautiful elm. Um, she's worried about the scales on the trunk and on the bark and on the curling, but we're a little more worried about a limb, I think. Right, right. Um, I love lace bark elm. Um, it's a wonderful elm that we should plant more of. Um, and that bark is actually not normal. It looks exactly like it's supposed to look. And if I don't know if the viewers can see it on the picture, but it looks like it has raised orange stuff growing on it. I think that's what she's worried about is the scales, but that's actually orange lena cells. That's the natural part. And uh, that's a characteristic of the tree that um, is, is really beautiful and people like it, but it's, it's a good, great tree to plant. Uh, the concern is that branch uh, to the right um, in the picture as I'm looking at it here. Um, that wound uh, is a nasty wound and ideally that branch probably should have been pruned off some years ago when the wound occurred. It's not too late to prune it off now. You want to prune it fairly close to the trunk that make, where it makes the smallest wound and make sure it's an angled cut. 
um, so the water will shed off. And then don't treat that pruning wound with anything at all. Um, that just can increase the risk of decay in the tree. So the tree may look a little odd shaped after you do that for a while, but hopefully that other trunk will kind of take over and branches will grow out and it'll look, go back to looking like a nice shade tree. All right, thanks Kelly. Well, as we've said before, we had a really long and cold winter leading up to spring. Now the heat has made life kind of miserable for a few of our shrubs. Right now we're going to take a look at a few of these problems, make some suggestions for replacements. We started getting questions early in the season about trees and shrubs that may have had some winter damage. And the classic ones that we got questions about included butterfly bush, which is suffrutescent, roses, hibiscus, boxwood, hydrangeas, button bush, you name it, we had questions about some shrubs. It's almost Father's Day, and that means if you're not seeing those plants come out of their winter doldrums, you probably have a dead plant. So if we start looking at butterfly bush, these are old plants, and you might notice that we're not only seeing just a little bit of growth on this one and a lot more on some of the others, but we're also seeing some cane injury. And whether in fact that is due to a poor connection from the root system when these tried to come back out after the winter or an insect, it's a little hard to tell. Nevertheless, this is not a good sign. You also, if you have plants like butterfly bush that have not started throwing any shoots whatsoever by this time of the season, it is time for you to start thinking about starting over. Hardy hibiscus is another plant that is very late to break dormancy, but if you have a plant that looks like this, a couple of things are going on. First off, it's in the wrong spot, had winter injury, maybe some herbicide damage, maybe a critter got into the roots or the shoots, but you clearly don't want this plant as one that you think is going to contribute to your landscape. You're after one that has a lot of stems, strong stems, getting ready to set those flower buds and begin blooming one bloom at a time, one day long, from about the 1st of July all the way through the season. So this is a plant that probably is not going to be one you wanna keep in your landscape. A lot of our shrub roses forgot the word shrub this year, and that includes the knockouts and a lot of the other ones. And you can see these have tried to come back. They have a handful of blooms on them, some reasonably good shoots, but you also look into the crown and you can see where all the damage was and all the death was during the winter months. One of the things again to look at if you do have shrub roses in your landscape is to make sure that those connections for those new shoots are strong. Make sure that if they are not grown on their own root, in other words, if they're grafted, that those shoots are not coming from below the graft union. And if you really wanna look at a tough and hardy rose that is a shrub, consider next year moving to the Rugosa type roses. Very thorny, very fragrant, maybe not as long a season of bloom, but you are very unlikely to get this kind of winter damage out of them. In the eastern part of the state in particular, we did get a lot of calls about death in boxwoods, and this is what it looks like. So this time of year, if you have these dead brown canes in boxwood, that is a former cane. You can see this is an older one. It is exposed to the west and the south. It is trying to throw some new growth in the interior of the plant, but if you have an entire side of a shrub, a boxwood like this that is showing this, the chances of it regrowing into something that really is useful in your landscape are pretty slim. So in conclusion, if you have plants this year that have really not begun to leaf out or show any signs of good growth, especially shrubs, it really is time to think about those as former shrubs and get some new ones started in your landscape. It is important to expect, inspect those shrubs this time of year and to know which ones are struggling. Of course, some of them are still maybe gonna see some wait and see, but I think we're pretty much past wait and see. Mm -hmm. Others are gonna have to be roged out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so picture round, last pictures. Um, this is an eight-year-old North Star cherry, brown spots, some rotting, sprayed with dormant oil, sprayed with orchard spray, otherwise healthy, has some suckers but what's going on and and lives this is a platsmith viewer and when i was looking at these cherries it it doesn't look like it's necessarily insect related might be past it mm -hmm. looks more like yeah. a 
pathology related question. I don't know if Sarah wants to even attempt to tackle. Sure. Oh, she came Actually, prepared. Actually, she brought I, some. I did. I, I looked at your pictures. I looked, or somehow I got, I ha happened to look at these pictures. Yeah. And so I think what they've got possibly going on there is brown rot, yeah. which is very common in the stone fruits. Here we've got a, a sample where this was an old fruit from last year that was infected with the brown rot fungus. And then they dry up. They, they stay on the tree, they become mummies, they reinfect the fruits the next year. You can see these fruits are dying. They probably are infected. The classic symptom of brown rot is a little bit later in the season, you're gonna see this soft, fuzzy brown covering on these infected fruits as they, um, they develop fungal structures and they sporulate. Um, so um, they needed to, to uh, work with the fungicides a little bit more. I think the chemical, the question said they used bonide orchard spray, right. which has sulfur in it as a fungicide. Sulfur can, does have fungicidal properties, but it's not a very strong fungicide. So I think they need to step up to a different product uh, that has um, a better fungicide in it, and they probably need to make more applications. Usually with fruit trees, fr fruit trees like this, it's about a Every two weeks, you're making an application to protect the fruits while until you're done harvesting. All right, good. So. And I love it when we have either, is it an insect? Is it yeah. rot? And yeah. somebody knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeff, this is, a, this is great. This is a viewer who lives in north central Pennsylvania. Ooh. But Nebraska still runs in his veins, mm. and he still watches us on the Internet. And what is this? And he took some of the weeds to Pennsylvania. <laughs> he did, because <laughs> we know exactly what that is. Uh, so that's smart weed. Yeah. And um, another um, uh, kind of buckwheat plant. So again, this is an annual, produces a whole bunch of seed. Uh, it's another one you want to avoid letting it, even though it is somewhat attractive when it's in, in flower and in seed, and it kind of looks like it's something you might want to keep but it produces a lot of seed. And um, I would say this would be one I would hoe and not worry about spraying. I don't know what the weather's like in Pennsylvania. I'm sure it's cooler than here. <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's simply killed with a, a hoe. So I think just hoe your garden and you should be good. All right, thanks, Jeff. Sarah, this is also a Plattsmouth viewer. Um, two acres outside Plattsmouth, corn and soybean fields on both sides waterway a week ago they looked fine this is uh, both her cukes and her corn but it looks like it's mostly on the south side of the rows she doesn't have any spotting on peas tomatoes peppers potatoes so what was suspicious to me about this question kim is it seemed the damage seemed to be directional mm -hmm. from the south side or the southeast portion of the vegetable garden mm -hmm. so i'm 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 harping on a theme here tonight but this looks like herbicide damage to me mm -hmm. um there are, there are some herbicides, if you actually get the droplets of, of uh, liquid landing on the leaves, you get a little dead spot, just like you saw in that picture with the corn leaves. So I don't know exactly which herbicide it was, but it sounds, again, like herbicide to me. So hopefully these plants will grow out of the damage, that they didn't have enough damage, that they'll suffer really serious effects. Sometimes the plants are um, delayed, so they'll kind of slow down their growth, and so your production is delayed but you should still get some production later in the season once the plants get going again. All right, so not sunburn in this case, probably. It doesn't, no, yeah, it doesn't look like spotty. sunburn. Yeah, and since it was directional, if it were sunburn, I would expect it to be more uniform over the whole patch. Yeah, okay, good, thanks, Sarah. This is a radish question, okay. Kelly. Uh, raised garden bed, she tries to plant early in the season, usually gets a couple of good ones, and then they bolt. <laughs> so he's wondering, is there something missing from the garden or is it, is it just the radish? Well, I mean, the number one cause of bolting in radishes, well, is, uh, is heat. Mm -hmm. um, but if you plant early enough, then, you know, that I guess it may not be that, except for this year. <laughs> most, most years that wouldn't have happened, but this year it certainly could have happened even if you planted early enough. Um, I didn't see any flower on you know, I didn't see a flower on the, so bolting is that the plant actually go, sets a stock, a, a flowering stock and flowers. And I didn't actually see that on there. I mean, it looked more like it was very, lots of foliage with no roots. And I mean, that can, so if it's actually bolting, then you're gonna have a flower stock, uh, which I did not see in the picture. So if, if the issue is that you have a lot of foliage, but you don't have much for a root, then again, it could be if you make sure you're not plant, make sure you're thinning, and you're not plant, you don't get overcrowding in there. Um, be careful of not too much nitrogen fertilizer because that can promote a lot of vegetative leafy growth at the expense of the roots. 
if you don't think any of those things are going on, um, you may want to try to change the type of radish that you're growing or cultivar or plant these <clears throat> plant radish as a fall crop instead of a spring crop and right. see if that helps. Thanks, Kelly. We have one announcement, and it's kind of a fun one. This is actually Father's Day, Wachiska Audubon Society's their 29th annual backyard garden tour. This coming Father's Day Sunday from 11 to 4, take your dad and go for a hike. Mm -hmm. And that's always a good one. All right, we are just into questions, gang. So um, this is great. This is somebody from Walt Hill, Wayne. You probably know where that is, kind of up your way. It is up my way. So he's been uh, mowing and gardening around milkweed and wonders how long he needs to leave the plants. His granddaughter is getting married this fall. He wants to mow them before the wedding, but he doesn't want, he doesn't want to ruin the monarchs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the advantages with that is if it really is a true fall wedding and it's after September 21st, then there should be no problem removing those milkweed stalks before that uh, for the monarchs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be already the middle, late August, they're already kind of heading south. So at this point, they're not interested in laying eggs. They're more interested in feeding on flower nectar and bulking up on food reserves as they head south to central Mexico. All right, thank you, Wayne. We don't know where this viewer is, but it's not gonna matter. Oh. <laughs> they have a great deal of brome invading oh. their lawn. What can be done to get rid of it permanently besides move? Uh, you know, what I would be, in, and again, I would wait till later in the year, is probably look at sectioning off the lawn and doing uh, a glyphosate treatment and just doing kind of a, a burn down and see if you can get that and then reseed those areas. Maybe do it systematically over a couple of years and see if you can kind of go through your lawn that way. Right. That might be, to me, the best way to handle it. Okay. Sarah, it's a couple of pear questions and we have had pear questions already. Mm -hmm. um, they don't look healthy. They have rots and spots on the foliage. And one, the one person, unfortunately, uh, she planted one to replace crab apples that also had spots. Mm. So what's going on mm. with the pears? Yeah, we do see some leaf spot problems in both the ornamental pears and the fruiting pears. And I, they don't really say in the question which, the, which these are. Um, you know, the thing about leaf spot diseases is generally, even if they're pretty serious and the, the tree is losing a lot of leaves later in the season because of the leaf infections, the, the infections themselves really are not that serious for the tree. Trees can often live, live with these infections for a long, long time. But from an aesthetic point of view for a homeowner, you know, they're tired of seeing those ugly leaves. They're tired of seeing leaf drop from their trees late in the season. Uh, so it becomes more of an of a aesthetic issue for the homeowner. You could get into a fungicide spray schedule for these plants, and that's what you would need to do because obviously they are susceptible to whatever disease that's affecting them. We need to figure out exactly which disease it is first and then you'd have to start uh, a spray program. Um, so, I don't know, if you wanted to get away from having a tree that's a high maintenance, you might want to get rid of this little pear and go for something else that is more resistant to these common leaf spots. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And you know, it is interesting. We're seeing very distinct differences in cultivar mm -hmm. for those right. pears right. showing that. Yeah. This is a spruce question, Kelly. Uh, it's along the driveway. The south side is showing what appears to be sun damage, kind of burned. Mm -hmm. Didn't notice it earlier in the year. Anything mm -hmm. they can do about that? They're not saying whether it's mm -hmm. burned all oh. the way back or just on the tips of the needles. Right. Well, if it's just on the tips of the needles, um, I, I think I would just leave it. Um, spruce will, um, they'll produce buds a back further along the stem and new growth will grow and eventually cover that up or next year's growth will cover it up. <clears throat> one, I mean, uh, one thing to consider is, that, you know, there is a disease called Suricoxus tip blight that'll affect just the very tips, um, which isn't that harmful to an established tree, but if you continue to see it year after year, um, then, you know, they might want to consider a, fun a fungicide spray starting next year. But if it's just a scorch, um, then again, maybe, maybe the trees need some watering because they're very dry. And I, you can prune it off. It really wouldn't hurt to prune it off. Just don't go back too far. But I think I just leave it and let the needles brown and dry up, and then next year new growth will cover it up. All right, thanks, Kelly. You have 20 seconds. Apricots that have something oozing out of the trunk. What might it be? And this is in Stapleton. It very well could be a peach tree borer that's gotten in there. Look for a hole uh, where that ooze is coming from. If not, it could be one of our lovely other 
bacterial diseases that are oozing out of the, that portion of the tree. All right, send us good, better pictures and mm -hmm. we will help you.